police do not have the right to detain people arbitrarily and force them under threat of law to identify themselves and be searched on the spot. The most significant effect of Regulation 233 was that it revived a piece of wartime legislation that was passed in 1939 to pr protect infrastructure in Ontario from the enemies of war. And the elephant in the room at all times in the discussion of law enforcement surrounding this event is, was it really required to enact a wartime piece of legislation that gave phenomenal powers to the police and was of questionable legality? This is an act, I have to remember, the 1939 act, as I said, is a relic. It's a uh, civil rights uh, landmine from World War II that was never repealed. It exists today. And it designates as public works, public buildings, public parks, streets, and highways. So theoretically today, the police could, on any of those areas, start saying, I'm enforcing a 1939 Public Works Protection Act. Uh, they didn't need the fence to do that. But people know very well, anyone who has a high school grade uh, law education knows very well that the police do not or cannot arbitrarily detain people in Canada to ask for their ID. So people just ignore the 1939 Act, except here when Chief Blair petitioned the government to extend the Public Works Protection Act in these three discrete areas listed in green. Because these three areas in green did not fall within the narrow provisions of the Public Works Act. So the police wanted to fill a greater zone of comfort. This is to put the police in a comfort zone. This is in Canada right now? No. We're wow. Now. We're in G20. That's right. You're in the G20. There was a premeditated, conscious, planned decision not to announce the existence of the regulation or the reviving of this uh, wartime act, this relic. The government essentially poked a hibernating bear, woke it up, and they didn't want the public to know. Instead, they quietly handed the police extravagant sweeping powers under 71-year-old law, powers that would almost certainly be illegal and unconstitutional under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Responsible protesters and civil rights groups who took the trouble to educate themselves about their rights prior to the G20 had no way of knowing they were literally walking into a trap. They were literally caught in the act, an act of public entrapment. The Public Works Protection Act and its pernicious regulatory offspring. Many of you will remember the added confusion when the Toronto Police Chief and some of his officers described the regulation as, quote, a five meter rule. Some of you reported about it. But there was no five meter rule. And even when this was corrected, police continued to arrest and search people well beyond the security zone. Our investigation revealed some very troubling facts about the ministry's conduct in sponsoring this regulation and failing to publicize it. It was unreasonable and grossly unfair. I'm convinced that the regulation was necessary and probably illegal. I've also raised serious questions about the Public Works Protection Act, a law that no other province has. This is why my main recommendation to the ministry is that it revise and consider replacing the act, particularly in terms of the powers it confers on the police, and that it ensure that such regulations are always clearly communicated to the public in the future. While the aim of hosting the G20 was to showcase Canada to the world, the passage and administration of Regulation 233 left ugly images and a sad legacy that we are still working to repair. I'm hopeful that this report and the Ministry's commitment to implement my recommendations will help to set things right and serve as a blueprint for how to handle such events in the future.
Regulation 233 is ground zero was in Chief Blair's office. No other police agency wanted anything to do with this regulation. Uh, it was sold to the province, and the province implemented it. And many of the other law enforcement partners learned about the existence of this regulation and then the misspoken application of this regulation, the very time you and I learned about it, when it was re uh, reported in the media. We did offer the chief two opportunities. I believe the letter has been distributed to you on August 5th. We wanted, uh, first of all, the officers who were shown uh, in various photos and video footage to come forward and explain what their understanding uh, was of this regulation that was passed. And that was refused. The uh, chief refused us access to those officers. And then, again, subsequently on August 26, we asked the chief to uh, interview him because we wanted to know what his understanding was of this regulation and what instructions he passed on to the force, the Toronto Police uh, Service. And again, we were we refused cooperation. You know, our role here is not like the SIU. We're not here to lay criminal charges or to investigate the criminal actions of the police. We're here to get an explanation. An explanation because this is a matter of great interest. And when the chief described this as the five meter rule, that bewildered you, it bewildered me. If any, there was any description that was more appropriate than the five meter rule, however erroneous, was to f call it the five kilometer rule. Because people were in Allen, uh, in Arlen Gardens, two kilometers away, having their knapsacks uh, examined and searched by the police. Uh, we encountered a woman who was leaving the Queen's Key Law Laws, and she was getting her groceries examined by the police, even though she was hundreds of meters from the fence. And this happened throughout Toronto, without any legal justification. You've got to be clear, police can ask whatever questions they want. You can ask people, what is your name? Please identify yourself. But what we saw, and we've, that's why we showed pictures of it, if you look at page 10 of the report, for example, we have three police officers stopping an individual on a bike and using the authority of the Public Works Act to force someone to identify themselves and be searched. That is illegal behavior. You can't do that. There's no legal basis for the police to do that. Unless, of course, they're relying on the Public Works Protection Act, which is wartime legislation. Yeah, at the time, how much cooperation did you get from Toronto Police Service? Zero. I mean, a zero cooperation, which is rather astounding. Uh, I'm not conducting criminal investigation. I could have subpoenaed Chief Blair. The ability under my act to subpoena people and to force them to give testimony under oath. Now, fortunately, this case is it was not necessary to uh, go down that route because we had access and full cooperation by the provincial ministry who uh, was able to provide us the letters and communication they had with Chief Blair. So Chief Blair's <coughs> participation was uh, not required in the end, really. We were able to get the job done without him. Uh, it's unfortunate, though, that we weren't able to uh, interview those officers that were captured on video and still images because we wanted to know uh, who had briefed them about their authority. Uh, but again, we found the answers to that through the ministry in the passage of a regulation under the 1939 Act. There are common law authorities where the police can, if they have reasonable grounds to believe you committed an offense, to search you. There's common law authority to protect uh, international dignitaries within reason. There's no common law authority that I'm aware of that entitles the police to exercise prophylactic scan detention. And that's what they were doing. I was placed in a cell uh, at the Toronto Film Studio and with, I was in a cell with 25 other young women uh, for approximately 13 hours. Throughout the time that I was detained, uh, I was told um, many uh, statements that I find repulsive and completely inappropriate uh, and what I view as threats. I was told I was going to be raped, I was told I was going to be gang banged, I was told that they were going to make sure that I was never going to want to act as a journalist again uh, by making sure that I would be repeatedly raped while I was in jail. When I was in the detention center, I saw numerous young women who were strip searched by male officers and one young woman when she was coming out who was completely traumatized said that she had had a finger put up her.
uh, and I find this completely unacceptable and I hope that people will uh, investigate this because from what I saw in the cell from the women who were getting, coming out uh, who were being strip searched, they were definitely traumatized. Well, actually, the girl who was mentioned of being raped, like I was saying her, her, her uh, fingers were put in her vagina forcefully, I actually seen right before that a cop come walking by putting on a blue glove and he said, time to feel the tush. And then he took her out of the cell and I watched and I kept that as a mental note for later because I knew that I'd want to testify on all this stuff. And then when they she, they brought her back, she had a really distressed look on her face. And I asked her if she was okay and stuff because I could, was in talking distance. And uh, I heard about what happened. And then I heard about on Alex Jones's website, Infowars, after. So that is true. I've seen that myself. Somebody really was molested in there. The ministry had its website. City of Toronto had a website. The Integrated Security Unit had websites. Had ads in the paper, warning about street closures, things that were going to happen. Was there any at one point mention that the police had a right, according to a 1939 law, to arbitrarily detain citizens kilometers away from the fence, to search their belongings, to force them to identify themselves? No, at any time there was not, and that was a conscious, premeditated decision by the authorities. I had gone on online and I got downloaded a copy off of ELAW's, a copy of that regulation. Apart from a coterie of senior officials in government and the Toronto Police Service, no one else was aware of the existence of this regulation or the fact that they would trigger what amounted to martial law in downtown Toronto. So did they withhold facts or did they lie to us? They just didn't announce. They took a decision not to announce, to be, uh, rea to be uh, reactive and not proactive, and to answer individual reporters' questions as they arose. Did you consult with the RCMP or the feds on the G20 to say, we are going to use this to protect the members of the G20? Yeah, I, I, I'm not in a position... Uh, Evan, to, to comment on what the, the minister may, may or may not have known, I had no conversation with him about that. Um, but it was part of an initiative undertaken by the Integrated Security Unit. We were working uh, collaboratively together. There were, there were police, all police services on that Integrated Security Unit represented there. Uh, certainly wasn't a secret from our policing partners, but I, I can't comment on what they knew or didn't know. Was this sort of some sort of attack on our democracy, or was this some sort of uh, on some kind of madness that overtook the people in a position of power in the way, in the face of this kind of international pressure? We have the means as a society to bring proper law and order. Many observers will tell you, legal experts, that you didn't really require any additional authority; that the common law authority and existing law was sufficient. But suppose the government disagreed. It had the option. The option was to pass a proper piece of legislation that protects people, not to rely on a 1939 piece of legislation protecting infrastructure. In the 1970s, when Prime Minister Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act, he presented it in Parliament. There was a debate. Rightly or wrongly, it passed, and it led to the arrest of just under 500 people with about 60 charges. Fast forward 2010, we bring back to life a 1939 act that leads to the arrest of over 1,000 people with 99 charges outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's disturbing. And for the citizens of Toronto, the days up to and including the weekend of the G G20 We'll live, we'll live in infamy as a time period where martial law set in the city of Toronto, leading to the most massive compromise of civil liberties in Canadian history. And we can never let that happen again. Did you know Thank you.